before we get As the project gained momentum, Dick and Gina made Irving public relaxed. appearances, speaking to groups to raise money and interest. So to kind of put everybody at ease, we'll go ahead and answer those to start with. There were always three questions, so they began answering them before they were asked. The first, question the first was about the possible departure date. That changed, but the other two remained the same. A little bit of luck, we can make that date, we hope. Oh, the second question? No, I'm not related to Chuck Yeager. No, she's not really related to Uncle Chuck. And, uh, what and about the, the third? And the, the answer to the third question, well, it will be collected in a device <laughs> like this and jettisoned overboard. The stress of the task began to damage Dick and Gina's relationship. I was pretty aware of it because Gina and I were fairly close at the time. And um, it, there, it's, it's hard to sort of really put into words, but I just think basically the whole pressure of the whole thing, anybody trying to put together a program like that, and they're both very, very strong individuals, and you've got to have somebody giving all the time, and neither one would give. So it was really tough. And um, they broke up about th three months before the program, before it flew. By early 1984, a group of volunteer workers had developed to support the Voyager program. Construction was close to being finished, and it was clear now that the flight was going to be far from comfortable. Dick and Gina, with their relationship deteriorating, would spend at least nine days cramped together in a cockpit less than 40 inches wide and 33 inches high. There were some major breakthroughs in assistance. King donated the avionics for the airplane, a package worth about a quarter of a million dollars. The engines were a problem. The rear engine would run for the whole trip. The front engine would be shut down after enough fuel had burned off. Teledyne Continental offered their new liquid-cooled engine. It had excellent fuel economy. But by the time Voyager was ready to fly, the engine still hadn't shown up. The interesting thing is it was not possible for me to test the Voyager structure before it flew. And you think, what do you mean not possible? That seems kind of strange. Well, let's think about it. How do you test the structure of an airplane? You grab a hold of the fuselage and you push or pull on the wings with jacks or shot bags or something. Uh, the Voyager's fuselage is so weak that if you just go up to it and knock on its skin, you've damaged its structure and, and failed it and needs to repair it. So I knew right off the bat I would not be able to even do a 1G static load test of this airplane. I would have to take the risk that my structural design was adequate. The Voyager flew for the first time on June 22, 1984, with Dick, the sole occupant. The engines for the flight, and for much of the Voyager's early test program, were like combings, like those that powered the Long Easies. It was an amazing sight as it left the ground. You know, an airplane looks like it flies, and flies like an airplane. This one looked more like a sailing ship. It looked like it, it, it was a sailing ship or a yacht sailing through the sky rather than flying. You didn't get the impression that it was flying due to its engines. You got the impression it was just sailing along due to the currents of the air. The second time out, Gina joined Dick in the plane, and the test program began. Very quickly, it became clear that the Voyager was extremely difficult to fly, especially with a lot of fuel aboard. When it was a heavier than 7,500 pounds, the airplane was unsafe in its longitudinal flying qualities. Uh, very difficult to fly because it tends to want to diverge. It would get worse and worse all by itself and the pilot would have to hold it and damp it and very carefully bring it back under control. That's not normal for an airplane. Uh, what we found is we were able to make the autopilot make the airplane fly stably. Okay, now when you say, well, that's not safe because if the autopilot fails, then the pilots have to fly it 
And Dick felt that the pilot could not fly it for more than just several hours before he'd be totally fatigued. And we were going out over the ocean. You'd be a day from land. So um, that's unsafe, you know. Dick was terrified of the plane. And I think Dick, at one point, actually believed he was going to die in the plane. He thought of it as, a, as something that was going to kill him, ultimately. On a flight to Oshkosh in 1984, Dick and Gina were almost killed when they hit rain and turbulence. But preparations continued. And I remember when he finally made the decision to go, I asked him quite frankly, I said, have you decided to go even if you're going to die doing it? You know, do you really think that you have a chance or are you just going to go out and do it because you said you would and now you know you're going to be killed in it? And he didn't answer me. It was tough to read him, really. And uh, Dick and Gina's uh, personal romantic relationship broke down a few months before the flight, so we were concerned that, hey, they weren't talking to each other adequately. Now, he was so afraid of it that he didn't want to take the risk of bringing her up to speed to fly it when it was real heavy. So to us, that was the bigger fear, is we've got to have two pilots in this airplane, not one. As Dick's fear of Voyager developed, Gina continued in her quiet way, preparing for the task ahead. She's a completely different personality in that it's almost as though she's missing the emotion of fear. She doesn't understand what fear is, and if you want to say it's a flaw, maybe it is a flaw, but that is what kept her rolling and kept her pushing. But Gina's time at the controls, especially with the plane heavy, was limited. Gina had very little time flying the airplane. So we knew that, hey, Dick's got to sleep sometime. <laughs> you know? um, th that was a major sore point, difficult issue. Dick, you've got to have Gina fly the airplane while you sleep. It hadn't happened, you know. In July 1986, they had one long flight of four and a half days covering almost 12,000 miles and setting a world closed course distance record. Now in December, they waited for a weather window that would allow them to tackle a task of much greater magnitude, the flight around the world. On the morning of Saturday, December 13, 1986, it came. Dick and Gina had used their friends and new friends and volunteers and people waving the flag and supporting hundreds of people. And it wasn't, they weren't able to say to those people, we chicken out. <laughs> uh, the other big concern was the, the mechanical reliability of the airplane. We had a flight plan that showed 225 hours, one flight. Uh, the vast majority of it not being anywhere near an airport or land for that matter. We had an airplane that had flown uh, total over two and a half years time period, uh, a total time of 300 and some hours. During that 300 hours we had at least seven emergencies and at least four or five of those, the airplane had an emergency such that it could not maintain altitude. It must land immediately. And we're planning one flight for 225 hours. On the morning of December 14th, Voyager would be loaded with 15% more fuel than it had ever carried before. It was unknown territory. We didn't know on the world flight morning whether we knew the airplane would be unstable, we did not know if it would be controllable. The day before, Voyager had been flown from Mojave to the takeoff point, Edwards Air Force Base. Now on the tarmac at Edwards, the engines are fired up. The rear engine is the new fuel-efficient liquid-cooled model from Teledyne. It will have to run for the whole flight without faltering, and that could mean over 240 hours. Fergie Fay checks it out with the greatest of care. Two lives and the whole world flight depend on it. It's a cold morning. Bruce Edwards, the crew chief, signals Dick to start the front engine. It also comes from Teledyne, a well-tried, air-cooled model that will be shut down after three or four days when enough fuel has been burned off. 
Bruce Edwards places the bubble canopy over the cockpit. Dick and Gina are now sealed inside, their personal differences forgotten, focused on a task that will confine them to this tiny airborne cell for almost 10 days. The wings double as fuel tanks. They're flexible and filled to capacity are very heavy. They are lowered from the supports to takeoff position, dangerously close to the ground. It's time to move out to the Edwards runway for one of the most dangerous flights in history. They realized very clearly that there was an enormous risk to their lives. I would think, if you really look at the details of what risks we took with Voyager, uh, the, the chances of a, uh, of a fatality were, were much higher than any of these other programs. 